yo, Kim, quit telling people how much you do and what you have and how much you've made. Right. I grew up around everybody. I didn't say anything to anybody about cash. Most people you know? Well, you started. all know the story about me being online, uh, trying to get a date. When my partner and I split up many years, people said, oh, you got to go online. you got to, yeah, this is a real New York story. you gotta, you got to go. And I said, oh, that's not me. And they said, no, 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 that's what you do. So I put a profile online, and it said, you know, recently ended a very long-term relationship, you know, successful artist, full life, lots of friends looking for a serious long-term relationship. So I'm online one day, and this email pops up, and it says, it's from Naked Man New York. <laughs> and I go to his profile, it says hi. So I go to his profile, and it says, Six and a half inch dick into mutual masturbation, wireless, <laughs> and tantric sex. <laughs> so I write to him and I say, did you read my profile? <laughs> and he says, yes. And I said, well, I read yours. Why on earth are you writing to me? <laughs> and he said, well, that's just my sexual profile. There are other things about me. It turns out, he, so I said, I'd be curious to know that. So he's a radiologist, he's a college professor, he's a very legit, successful guy. So I said, where do you live? He said, Stuyvesant Town. I said, wow, I grew up in Stuyvesant Town. What do you pay for rent? <laughs> <laughs> and he wrote back, don't you think that's an awfully personal question? <laughs> <laughs> musical instrument was guitar at age five. We had a friend, Ida Appleman, who, who my parents knew, and she came over to give us guitar lessons. And then when I was 13, uh, I was on my way out to play punch ball one day, and my father said, it was a Sunday, and he said, where are you going? And I said, I'm going to play punch ball. And he said, practice the piano. And I said, no, I'll practice later. And he said, no, I practice the piano. I said, no, I'll practice later. He said, if you leave this house, I'm stopping your lessons. And I left the house, and I never took another piano lesson until college, and I taught myself the piano. Went back to the Dowper School the first summer after college to get a teacher certificate. Mm -hmm. And I got what's called a, an elementary teacher certificate. And the head of the school uh, sat me down when she gave me the certificate. She was this Swiss woman, very serious sort of. And she said, you are one of the most gifted people to ever walk through these doors. And you potentially have a great career ahead of you in music. However, recently I've noticed a trashy nightclub idiom infiltrating your improvisations. And if you aren't very careful, you might end up in the pit of a Broadway show. Every time uh, a big star came on who did not actually happen to have their own uh, musical director with them, the same person seemed to be sitting there at the piano every time. And you get sort of used to seeing this young man walk in who was thin and tall and bespectacled and, and kind of shy. But after about, oh, maybe four or five, six times, I don't remember, he said to me, I know you're right, you're going to be recording a new movie. Um, I know you're going to be recording a new record. Right. Would you mind listening to a CD of some of my songs? And I said, I'd be delighted. Now, anybody that's a singer is used to tons and tons of, of you know, demos being sent to them. And they're all horrible. They're just embarrassing. Everybody who can sing in the shower thinks they can write a song, too. And it's such a unique ability and such a unique gift. So I just went, well, sure. And I always listen. But then I'd write a little note. It's not what I'm looking for, that right. kind of thing. Well, this time I put it on in my dressing room and I listened. And eight out of the eight songs were brilliant songs. <laughs> a lot. Men like Galahad and Sir Lancelot always did the things I'd like to do. Physically I'm not as durable, but romantically I'm incurable, and I'd like to do the same for you. Have you got any castles that you want me to build, baby? I think when I look back on all the time that I've spent singing in the shower or wherever in the car, I always thought that it was about 
you know, reproducing what's on the record. So, if, you know, if this guy sounds like this and he has to sound like that. And, and, and really, it's kind of ridiculous to do that because it's already been done. Why do you want to recreate what somebody... And it, whereas he just showed me that it's not about, it's not about trying to sound like somebody else or sound like you think the record sounds. It's about singing it how you would sing that. And actually when you do it that way, all of a sudden you're freed from that constraint. You know, I work in finance, I'm a hedge fund, I trade currencies. The music thing is just a departure away from you know, Wall Street and making money and trading. And mm. you know, you know some, something that you do for, because it's you like to do it. You're not doing it not doing it because I ever think I'll be good at it or I'll make money at it or anything like that. No. If I could be, if I could be a great singer, uh -huh. I way take that. Yeah. Over all that other stuff. You, know, you could have a million people working for you, and you could have this title, and, and no, I, I don't care. I don't want it. I'm the type of guy that would never settle down, but pretty girls are. So it would have to be some pretty extreme circumstance. settled down where pretty girls are. That's, you know that I'm around. I'll kiss them and I hug them. I don't see you looking though at okay. person. Okay. person is right here. I'm the type of guy that would never settle down where pretty girls are. That's when I'm around. Are your eyes open? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> it's it's kind of, where pretty girls are. That's when I'm around. I'll kiss them and I hug just stare and don't move. I kiss them and I hug them, cause to me they're all the same. I hug them and I squeeze them. I don't even know their name. They call me the Wanderer. Okay, do it again. Yeah. I'm the type of guy that would never settle down. Doesn't it's seem like you're looking at someone. I know, I know, no. I know. You're in your head. Okay. I'm the type of guy that would never settle down. Where pretty girls are, you know that right. I'm around. Come up here from there. Okay. Stand right here. Okay. <laughs> I'm the type of guy that would never settle down. Where pretty girls are, you know that I'm around. I kiss them and I hug them, because to me they're all the same. I hug them and I squeeze them. I don't even know their name. They call me the wanderer. Yeah, the wanderer. The wanderer, the wanderer, the wanderer. Now we should kiss him. Okay, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. you're doing it to him. Okay, okay. No, 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 no,
that never settled down. The pretty girls up, you know that I'm around. I kiss a man, I hug him, cause to me they're all the same. I hug a man, I squeeze him, they don't even know my name. They call me the Wanderer. Yeah, the Wanderer. The Wanderer. I went to this camp and wrote these musicals, and I wrote a children's musical that I brought to New York with me. I brought it to a little theater, the 13th Street Theater, and they decided they wanted to do it, and they said, do you play piano? And I said, yeah, I play piano. And so they gave me a job at $10 a show to play eight shows a week for their little theater. And uh, one thing led to another, and uh, I played an audition for somebody, for Mitch Lee, who wrote Man of La Mancha for a new Broadway show. And uh, he noticed me, because it was an audition for a friend of mine, and she was not quite ready to do that part. Toa Felch, who ended up getting it. But he put her through the ringers and changing keys and doing it. And he noticed me, and he sort of called me out. And I ended up assisting him and playing the auditions. And then through a whole series of people being incompetent and things happening, I ended up conducting that show on Broadway without having ever conducted an orchestra in my life. I conducted it, and I noticed that the orchestra was always a little behind me. And so I pushed something in my beat. I didn't realize at the time that the reason the orchestra is behind me is because I have the thought that they're going to be behind me. So I added stuff into my beat that years later, after conducting thousands of performances on Broadway, I had to, um, I had to take three years off and really learn to conduct. Uh, over again. David always had an affinity for music. I always had records and I always played records, mostly classical. And his attention to the playing, you could see he just... He was uh, enthralled with music. I, I watched him as a kid, and he, he would listen to the music intently. I'm in real estate because of David. David took a place up in the country, not far from where I am. Mm -hmm. And he said, Dad, you got to come up here so you'll be close to me. So I bought a house up there, and a year later, he moved. <laughs> David has written probably 500 brilliant songs that no one's heard. He's had some success with uh, Help Is On The Way, Listen To My Heart, so many, you know, uh, you gotta be rich, I wanna be rich, famous, and powerful, so many great, great songs that the cabaret audiences know. But those of us who know David well know, know this treasure, this treasury of a trunk he's got. <laughs> you I knew that you were the one for me I didn't know how to tell you but I knew how it would be we'd live in a house on a hill and spend our days making love um, Dana uh, was taking David's musical workshop Dana Lorge in class she's a wonderful singer yeah you? Dana's great and she said, why don't you come to this musical workshop that I'm in? This guy is fantastic. David Friedman is the man that wrote uh, Listen to My Heart. Here we are, you and I at last at the right place, at the right time. I did that as an opening thing for my show. I didn't remember that he wrote it. Oh, my God. And I just fell in love with the way he just was so kind and um, simple and addressed people as they were, who they were, where they were at and he just opens it up like an envelope. He just takes out what's inside of them mm -hmm. that they don't even know that they have because we cover. And acting, he, he's an acting teacher. He, right. he's, he works with you as an actor. Right. He works with you with a story, a beginning, a middle, and end, who your relationship is, 
what are you, where are you coming from in this place that you are now, where you find yourself? Right. And he just keeps chip, chip, chipping away at anything extraneous that has nothing to do with anything. I believe in him. I just believe in him. I believe that he has something to say. He's one of these rare teachers, coaches, that is instrumental, to use a word, in making you the instrument that you can be. So what I get is that you're not hearing belt in your head. Does that make sense? Yes. You're hearing, I don't really belt, and now I'll try and belt. So what's happening is, is your voice is sitting lower than it. It's the same principle that we did with the, with the acting. Each note is its own thing. What happens is we hit a high note and we say, OK, now I know where the belt is, and I'm just going to hold it there. So it's good old day, good old Like you're screamer. lifting your neck okay. to reach for the nose. Sing it like you're a big belting opera singer. Like Captain Caesar Salad. Captain Caesar Salad. Go down the hill. I don't know what's wrong. She heard that sound. She had a real sound that you heard. The other one, you're not quite hearing cat. So, you, so what you want to work on is hearing a bell voice. Not trying to sing bells. I got married my junior year in college. And really young. My, it's unbelievably young. My parents had gotten married when they were 21, and I was just emulating them. I was gay and didn't know it. So there was a whole path it took, and what happened was I sort of had a nervous breakdown, uh, which I came to understand was my body telling me that you are not going to be able to live a life that is not authentic to you. I told my father I was gay several years before I told my mother, and he didn't so was tell her. It was easier. And uh, it just ha well, what happened actually was my father was taking est, I was taking est. I was I was coming from my about sex seminar, and he was coming from his upset seminar, and we met for dinner. So <laughs> it just seemed like a perfect. So he, so he never really did tell your mom. He never told her, and, and in fact, like my mother was at my apartment. I lived in the middle of Greenwich Village, right. and she, just to show you, she my, I had borrowed a book from my grandmother, and I hadn't returned, and it was sitting on the bookshelf. And she looked from across the room and she said, that's Nana's book, you didn't return it. Next to that book was The Joy of Gay Sex, coming out. But, but you, know, you know, she didn't see any of those. <laughs> she just, you know, zeroed in, in on, on that, that book. Yeah, yeah. When I told her, she was shocked. She said all the right things. She said, I love you, I'm very surprised. Now, 
dad even said something that my mother would be surprised and no one knew you know at my surprise 50th birthday party julie halson was the host and my parents were there and she said shirley charlie you know he went to funny girl and sat in the first row with binoculars and you didn't figure out you know <laughs> you know there was right, all right, that. Right. but so um so she said the nice things and then i took my bicycle home and my father called and said get over here your mother's hysterical and I came over and my mother was serving dinner and it was just lovely. And my father tells me my mother never forgets the day in which I told her that. You know, but it, so it was very complex. My mother, I think, felt... What do you think their discussions were together when both... I think their discussions were a lot of my father trying to override my mother and convince her that, you know, no, don't... That's silly. You know, there, there, there was a... You know, that was a different... Did the tone of your relationship to your parents change after that? Uh, well, it got a little more honest. Then my mother, when I got together with my first long-term partner, my mother said, you know, I just, they moved to New Jersey where they retired and they had all their close friends. And my mother said, I just feel uncomfortable. I'm sorry about my friends knowing mm -hmm. that you're gay. I said, um, does it bother you that uh, Lillian's son, Bobby, uh, lives with a black woman. She said, no. I said, does it bother you that Kiki's daughter, Peggy, is a lesbian? And she said, no. I said, what makes you think that it's going to bother? She said, I just can't. So I said, fine. You're entitled to do that. Just never expect me to show up if I either have to not bring Scott or I have to pretend he's not who he is. So I won't be coming to Thanksgiving and I'll go to Scott's parents and we'll do things. Again. And we just sort of did that. And after five years, my mother one day said, oh, Kiki and Phil are having us over to dinner. Come on. And it was just all in the open. And, oh, and that was it. It took her five years. But I essentially said to my parents, I said, you know, I mean, I came out when I was in my 30s. I met my boyfriend when I was 34. So I was not 20. Okay, right. I said, you have a choice. This is my life. And it's going to be my life. You can participate in it. Or you cannot. If you would like to know when I'm feeling sad, when I'm having trouble, when I'm this and that. You're welcome to know. If you don't want to know, you will be cut off from me. I won't cut you off, but you will lose. And they chose to participate. And so, so. How I started out was I get up on that stage and I said, you know, I, I, I turned to spirituality in my midlife. And I'd hold up some. That's already funny. You well, yes. Like that. <laughs> whatever book I was holding okay. up. And I said, said, I can't get up here and complain like so many comics do. But I will tell you the number one complaint that I have heard okay. on this stage. And it's from women. And it's about how hard it is to meet a straight guy in New York City. And I say, and that's all I ever meet. Because <laughs> I, I know what David's greatest gift is to me. He's not afraid of anybody else succeeding. He's completely willing that everybody succeeds in the world. At the end of a song that David and I wrote called I Want to Matter, it basically says, though I'm fragile and foolish and flawed, I'm sincere. I want someone to fondly remember me here. More than being praised, more than being flattered, I need to know without a doubt that somehow I have mattered. And if I'm really honest, I would like to be the song that someone will be singing long after I am gone. skies do I see this life that's no better and no worse than anybody else's but I'm just I find now that I'm appreciating everything that happened to me because anything that happened to me I now can empathize you know one of my favorite jokes that I tell is the joke about the guy who sleeps with the animals you know I told that joke uh, the man goes to a psychiatrist he says the psychiatrist says what's your problem he says I can't tell you it's too awful 
He says, look, I'm a psychiatrist, whatever, whatever it is, I can accept it. He says, no, it's too terrible. He says, try it. He says, all right, I love my dog. He says, well, many people love their dog. He says, no, you don't understand. I have sex with my dog. I sleep with my dog. The psychiatrist says, well, it's not the first time I've heard this. You see, I can accept this. This is not anything else, you know. Then he says, well, I slept with a horse once. He says, same thing. He says, he says well, a couple of sheep. He says, well, once I slept with a chicken. He says, ugh, a chicken? How could you do that? <laughs> so that's what people are waiting for is that chicken where their problem is, oh, that's disgusting, that's insoluble, and I don't believe that any problem is. Nothing but bluebirds all day long. I never saw the sun shining so bright. I never saw things going so right. Noticing the days hurrying by. When you're in love, my, my, how they fly.